All right, good afternoon. We're on the record in the matter of the petition for uh, in the matter of the petition filed by Maureen Mananian Bobekian. Uh, this is um, Office of Administrative Hearings, case 2017-030763. Today is March 30th, 2017. And if I may have uh, the board members uh, state their appearances for the record, beginning with um, Mr. Wong. Albert Wong, professional member. Stan Weiser, professional member. Victor Law, professional member. Debbie Beal, professional member. Amy Gutierrez, professional member. Laban Zubaglu, professional member. And Carter Sanchez, uh, public member. Alan Chad, professional member. And uh, my name is Marilyn Woolard. I'm the administrative law judge assigned for this matter, to this matter. And I have appearances on behalf of the Deputy Attorney General. Thank you, Your Honor. Supervising Deputy Attorney General Joshua Room, appearing on behalf of the people, pursuant to Government Code 11522. And for uh, the petitioner, may I have Good afternoon, Your Honor. Peter Grigorovic for the petitioner. Ms. Mananian Bulbekian is present. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and and uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Ms. Mananian, you were here earlier today when I discussed the procedures, and you heard the explanation about the procedures earlier on. Uh, I see you're nodding your head for the record. You need to articulate the answer because this is being tape recorded. Is that a yes? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, so you understand you do have a right to testify, to call witnesses on your own behalf, and to explain to the board why you believe your petition should be granted. Yes. All right. And um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Room will begin by giving an overview about the present uh, about, about, about your case. Uh, you'll then have an opportunity to be placed under oath and directly address the board to call any witnesses. Um, and I believe we did discuss off the record uh, that you don't have any additional exhibits today. Is that correct? That's all. The petition package is complete. It, it is complete, Your Honor. I did receive this morning, uh, yesterday, and we don't want to obviously rehash the 2009 incident, but since that event, the friendship has rekindled between Maureen and her friend whose credit card she used. Her friend did write a letter in support, but unfortunately, I don't know what evidentiary weight it could offer because she printed her name and didn't sign it and didn't provide her name and address for follow-up, although I'm sure we could get that. So I have no objection, Your Honor. We, we could present that then. If you do want to pre present that letter, um, I can circulate among the board, also with the understanding that we're not here today to, uh, to relitigate any of the underlying facts. Correct. Okay. All right. So we can, uh, if you want to. Uh, Your Honor. Yes. Before we start, could I yes. disclose that I'm, I serve as the uh, member of the advisory board on the Western New York School of Pharmacy, so I don't know if that would create a conflict of interest. Just wanted to disclose that. I don't think so. And I believe you indicated previously you didn't believe it would, it would affect your ability to impress. Uh, it's not a paid position. It's a volunteer position that I have, uh, which I serve as an advisory role to the dean of the pharmacy school. Well, I'm on the same committee with with Victor as well. We're both on the Dean's Advisory. It doesn't involve any students. It's just advising the Dean on academic matters. So I, I think it's fair to proceed and we do have a uh, quorum here today. All right. Um, Your Honor, may I approach yes, and present please. this to you? Thank you. All right, so um, Mr. Uh, Rum, if you'd care to begin your overview and, and you would address the exhibits as part of that. Thank you, Your Honor. I've placed before Your Honor three documentary exhibits. The first of those being a one-page uh, exhibit that is Ms. Mianyan's, uh, Gubikin's, uh agreement to have this uh, hearing electronically recorded as opposed to reported by a court reporter. I ask that that be marked and admitted. Marked and any objection? No objection. Marked and admitted as, as exhibit A. Second is uh, Ms. Mianyan's uh, petition for early termination and related documents, uh, including the petition itself, uh, her typewritten answers to the questions in the petition, uh, a one-page transcript so showing her enrollment in Western University from 2013 to the present, to 2016 at that time. Um, she's expected to graduate in 2018. Uh, a certificate for completion of the UC Irvine ethics course on May 15th and 16th, 2015. A cover letter from her counsel, Mr. Gorovic, 
And then there are letters of recommendation, a total of eight, four of them from board licensees uh, and four from private citizens. All eight of those were verified. Uh, I don't know if the board members received the same prior memorandum that I did, but since that original memorandum was printed, one of the members who, one of the authors who could not be contacted has been contacted, and so all of those eight right, letter writers have been verified. So I'd ask that all, that be marked in a minute. Um, any objection? No objection. And the same uh, comment regarding page one of the petition, the uh, date of birth and the residence address will be redacted, and as redacted, exhibit B is Thank you, Your Honor. And then finally, the uh, underlying uh, uh, administrative uh, documents in this case. There's a statement of issues that was filed on, against petitioner on May 3, 2014, in case number 5134, alleging six causes for denial arising out of petitioner's 2010 conviction of one count of theft of an access card and what was believed to be her incomplete or inconsistent account of that conviction or the underlying conduct in her application to the board. On August 12, 2014, petitioner, acting without counsel, agreed to and signed a stipulated settlement and disciplinary order, admitting to the statement of issues and stipulating to a disciplinary, disciplinary order, granting her an intern pharmacist license, immediately revoking it, and staying revocation in favor of five years probation, standard terms and conditions, plus supervised practice, an ownership prohibition, and an ethics course. The, that became the decision and the order of the board adopting the stipulation effective December 9, 2014. Ask that that be marked and admitted, Your Honor. Uh, any objection? No objection. That uh, uh, packet is marked and, and admitted as Exhibit C, and then I've marked for identification as Exhibit D the um, one-page letter with a handwritten signature, uh, Larissa F O E L L, and I will circulate that for marking. Thank you, Your Honor. Any objection to? Uh, you you'd indicate no objection. No to objection, Your Honor. So, Petitioner Marie Marie Gilbekian forgive me if I've butchered either of those, is now 38 years old and was issued her intern pharmacist license number 35160 on October 16, 2006. That license is active and current until May 31, 2019. She doesn't report any other licensure. As has been mentioned, the discipline in this case resulted from her 2010 conviction of one, th one count of theft of an access card and her incomplete account of that conviction in her application. She agreed to a period of probation of five years effective December 9, 2014. She's therefore served a little over two years, two years and three months or so, so that the probation would, uh, so the petition is seeking to terminate about two and a half years early, building in the time for the board's decision. Petitioner has been compliant with the terms and conditions of probation. She completed the required ethics course in May 2015, and she's compliant with all other, all other terms and conditions of probation. Business and Professions Code 4309A2 requires a two-year lapse before a petition for early termination of probation of three years or more. So this petition was proper any time after December 9, 2016. It is supported by the requisite number of letters from board licensees, four where two are required, and private citizens, again, four where two are required. It's not supported by any proof of CE, but since CE is not required for intern pharmacist renewal, that's not surprising. I submit subject to cross-examination, Your Honor. Any opening statement? Yes, a brief opening statement, Your Honor. Um, first, I'd like to say it is, it is really my privilege to represent Maureen here today. And I say it's a privilege because at this point in my career, I'm very selective of, of who I choose to represent and help and who I just pass on. Um, Maureen found me through her pharmacy law and ethics professor, Dr. Tony Park. Um, and when he heard her story, he referred her to me to see if I could assist her with the petition, because along this journey, she was not represented by any counsel. Um, and it's noted that she entered into the stipulation without counsel. Um, this journey has taught her a number of lessons. And um, she'll tell you that herself. I, I believe testimony by narrative may be more beneficial than me asking her specific questions and, and having her uh, just give those answers to my questions. But I, I'd like to focus, Maureen, on two points. And that, Maureen, is I would like you to tell the judge and the board what you've learned from this experience and why you chose to file your petition at this time. Thank you, Speaker. And, all right. And thank you. you and I'll, sworn. I'll swear you in if you'd raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth and the whole truth? Yes. 
Can you just turn the microphone towards you a little bit? Thank you. And you can begin. First, I want to thank you, Boyd, and Your Honor, for giving me, giving me opportunity to be here today and uh, present myself as an individual, not as a paper or a case. Because <clears throat> whatever have, have happened to me, it was something that I probably will regret the whole of my life um, because it's what I, the mistake I made. I am really sorry, and it impacted whole my life. And my, I'm I'm sorry. The mistake I made impacted the whole my life, and uh, my dream, my career, and those years that I invested in it. Because I started my education, I'm an immigrant, and, and I'm sorry if my English is not as well as yours. This is my third, third language. And being mom, uh, full-time mom, at that time as my kids were like four and six, and now I have another one, uh, which I'm happy to be mom in degree three. <laughs> um, put me more responsibility to realize what I made, what I did, the poor ju judgment I did at that time when, when it happened. Why I'm here? Because whatever had happened, it's right now limiting my ability, my education, limiting the specter of the pharmacist to be. I'm done with my didactic part of the pharmacy because I'm already in P3, first year, uh, third year of pharmacy school. Now, I need to go to rotations. Since the first day of the having probation status of the license, one of the requirements is to complete 40 hours per month. Made me realize what I did. What it was a very bad choice. Because nobody wants Peter. Nobody literally. I have two meetings with the board and they're really helpful me there, advising how to talk, what to be, where to go. I did my best, I tried my best. And my, the other hand, my school, they are very supportive, but also they are telling me, if your license remain like this, if we could not put you on rotation sites, you won't graduate. The stress, the fear, and was, it's, I can't express how, what I was going through. And the other side, my family, my kids, I don't have to show them. I have to be happy. I have to be mommy. I have to be wife. I, and I decided that I'm a strong person. I can do this because I can't give up at the last moment. So I was lucky enough that my first rotation, actually it was my second one, second rotation in pharmacy, year, uh, second year of school, um, Western University gave up like calling and getting the refusals from me. So we have Western University Pharmacy in our campus. So Dr. Miralis, which is PIC in our pharmacy, he agreed for me to volunteer after my school because my school is 50 miles away from my house. So I'm driving 100 miles per day. So it's, and it's easy for me after classes. And sometimes when we have like offs, I was going there to volunteer just to complete my 40 hours per month. Uh, which gave me very good experience and clinical knowledge. But now when I'm done with my uh, didactic parts of the school, so I have to go to rotations. And being there, uh, being in our pharmacy, Western University, I, it's a kind of different type of pharmacy. It, we, are doing, we are doing more ambulatory care, uh, medication, um, MTMs, like patient interaction is more than in regular chain pharmacies. And I found myself that this is what I really want to do. I want to work with the patient. I want to uh, talk about their problems. I want to invest time. I want to uh, help them. It's not like they're coming to refill the medication pills and then look at you as you're uh, selling like medications for them. I want to see pharmacists as a provider, as a um, healthcare provider, as somebody that want to help them. So, and that's where I approach my director who is doing the inter, um, our rotation sites and I'm like, can I go to uh, like a city of hope uh, uh, or children's hospital because, uh, you know, it happened in our life that I was there and I saw how 
you can go to floor, interact with the patient, how it works. And they said, I've, unfortunately, you cannot be there because they don't want student on to being probation, doing their rotation there. I myself have an experience before getting to volunteer, as I said, I was going everywhere. So, and also there was an opening in Ka uh, Kaiser Woodland Hills, California. I applied, they called me, they liked me. And the fact that I can speak fluently three languages and, uh, you know, the other, I don't want to like talk about me. They, they like me, they, they want to hire me. At that time, I was waiting for my license that because um, deputy Mr. Matthew King, he was doing my case and I don't have any lawyer because I was very inexperienced. I don't know what gonna be and how it's gonna be. They just, they promised me license and the word license make me so happy that, oh my God, because all my classmates has, has license and my school pushing me. If no license, you're gonna be out of the school. And I'm like, again, fear that, what are you talking about? Like seven years with kids, with everything. Now I'm, it, this is, and that was the only school I applied because having family and my husband, he's the only one who support me. We, I cannot like, move around the country to other schools, like other students have the opportunity to apply 10 schools. I applied to one school and I get to that school. So be sure what happened when they see my license on probation, HR didn't even want to talk, listen to take anything from me. Even though pharmacists like me, they want me to be there. They're like, Excuse, sorry, we're not taking you. And this experience that going through this everything is like, I'm very humiliated and I feel very shame and I feel very sorry what I did I don't know I just it's first because I was brought up in the family that high standards and morals are we have it's beyond everything and the mistake I did I didn't realize that I'm doing that bad and I didn't have any intention to put wrong information in my board of pharmacy application because what happened I have never seen police talking to me it's the first time, and when they said that, is it your card? I'm like, no. Do why are you using other people? Like, you know how they talk. And then, like, I said that, yeah, yeah, I did wrong, and I admit that. But in the application, I thought I can explain how it happened. I didn't have any intent to put wrong information and and named liar. I'm not a liar. And for me, being, uh, I'm trying to do, because I'm a mother in first place. I want to be role mother for my kids. Even when I'm studying for my test, and right now my son is already in high school, my daughter is in middle school, I'm showing them, like, you know, Levon, you know, Lena, you cannot get here without putting an effort. See, I'm studying when I'm getting my grade, when I'm getting, if you want to do something, you have to put effort, you have to be honest, you have to, like, I myself, like, my point is, like, morals, being high standard, be, being honest, it's more than other things. This is the way my parents brought me up. And this is how my now family is, how my relationship with my husband and I live by my in-laws and we're like family. And I want my, my kids see that. And I'm really like that with my patient. It's not my patient, the patient that I'm volunteering in the pharmacy and I'm treating with them and the letters of my professor that they invested time to describe for you for what, who am I? And I even remember both board of pharmacy members when we were at the meeting, but when I was frustrated, I'm sorry, I couldn't find any place to be there. They're like, just go there. If they see you, they like you, they hire you. I'm like, I'm doing that literally. I'm walking there and they're like, I'm sorry. And you know, when they see probation, they're like, we don't want board of pharmacy in our pharmacy. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> Anything else at this time? I'm just, if you have any questions, I'm here to open, like, I can go what happened, and, like, I just need help to continue my education in the level I really want. I just don't want to be limited because, you know, I have this opportunity to get, especially now when the pharmacy, scope of pharmacy, like, pharmacists are wider. And we have that opportunity. I don't want to lose that opportunity, just finding those limited small pharmacies, go there and like just fill the prescription. I, I, I would, of course, it's one of my bills, but you know, I want more clinic. I want more, use my knowledge what I gained during these three years. 
Why don't we open the qu uh, for questioning? Mr. Rim, do you have any questions? I do, Your Honor. Um, why don't we start with an easy one? What are the other two languages you speak? Russian and Armenian. Okay. Um, and as sort of briefly as you can, can you just lay out exactly what did happen between okay. you and your friend with regard to her uh, bank card? Actually, uh, she's more than a friend. Me and my husband were best men of um, and men of owners. Card. Yeah, in their wedding. So we're kind of family close to each other. I guess it's also that me not raised here, not understanding the importance and that you cannot even though have a permission use the card, you cannot sign it. I know when I'm going back, I'm like, it's wrong. It's not me. How can I get the card and sign? So I'm kind of being more mature, being more in the country, being more educated. Now I realize like what I did, it's not bad. It's awful. So, um, yeah, I was in the Bloomingdale's. Uh, I need to shop, and it's like, I we were with kids. I have her permission to, because she has a Bloomingdale's shop, um, store card. But what I have to have, pay cash. To, the truth, even my husband didn't know about that because he's always supportive, and it's not that i in need of money. That's why I did that. She's just like, you know, sometimes there are some discounts when you're using the card. You know, women brain, I didn't even think that that what I'm doing is wrong. And when the security asked me, um, is it your card? And I said, no. No, she asked, they asked for, no, not the security, the tender, they asked me for ID, and they said, I don't have ID, and they're like, is it your card? I didn't lie, I said, no. And then I, they call and they take me in, and then they're like, uh, do you have the permission to use, and the, the way they talked me, I was so scared, I'm like, what if I put Larissa in bad situation, what if, I don't want her to be in trouble. And I said no. By saying no, I didn't realize that they're going to call police. And when police come, and then they're like, you have to admit, otherwise blah, blah, this, this. I was shaking. I was scared. I'm like, how it going to be? My kids, my husband. And, and just everything was whatever they said. <clears throat> and then the, the trials went, and my lawyer, oh, what, what happened? I'm sorry. She was afraid to admit that she gave me the card. And she refused that she gave me the card. And what happened in reality, everything was like one day I was in jail. I was doing community service. And I was even ashamed to look at my kids' eyes, even my husband, even my parents. What happened? When they said you learn on your mistakes, I wish my mistake wasn't this bad. For me, it's really crucial. For me, it's, I don't know. So um, you've said that you are at the stage of your education at Western where you would need to begin doing clinical rotations. Right now, yes. Yeah. And what, how many of those rotations would you need to do before you would graduate? Uh, so it's till 2018 May. So you would be doing... I just started... Okay. So my first rotation in, uh, as I said, Western University Pharmacy again with Dr. Klaus, but it's a military care, so we're doing INR clinic under the protocol with physician. So are you saying that you will be unable to complete your rotations while you're on probation? Or can you do all of your rotations in Western University Pharmacy? No, I cannot. I have to be in the hospital cell as well. Okay. Um, and if you are unable to complete your rotations, what will happen to your Western University enrollment? They kind of, I won't graduate. Now, um, you've heard me ask other people a similar question. Um, when you entered into the stipulation, um, you understood that you were entering into a five-year probation and that it had all these terms and conditions. I understand you may not have known exactly what that meant. But why should the board now give you a different uh, uh, outcome than you were given at the time that you agreed to the probation? That's what I want to really talk about this. That's what I... When the, Mr. K, um, Deputy King, when he told me, like, we're going to grant give you license and that Kaiser were pushing me because they want to hire they want to hire me and they need for the license whatever he said I said yes 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 I was thinking like oh I have a license I didn't realize that being on probation it's like closed door to you in everywhere I didn't know that 
And I didn't hire a lawyer at that time. I just, I just, yes, basically said yes. It's not that without thinking. I just, I was so desiring for my intern license to have it that I didn't realize that it will me, it will cause me such like problems and humiliation because every time I have to go to anywhere volunteering time, I have to tell that my pharmacist what's happened. And you know, every time, you know how they judge you. They don't know you and maybe for some day it's okay, but for me, I'm going through that dead day, which is October 18, 2009, every time. It was a nightmare for me. I have nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Any questions? You want to begin with Mr. Sherrod? Having, well, having read the case, um, I, I don't see a pattern here either. I see a, uh, one incident that even reading the letter from your friend uh, gives a validity to it. I don't see a criminal. I don't see a person who, um, you know, continues a pattern of mischief and so forth. I think you've know, done two, yeah. two years probation and the embarrassment, the dealing with the family, all the heartaches that come with that. Um, I think you just brush it off, continue that profession of yours and pursue your dream. Thank you so much. I just want to add, even they, they don't know that what I'm going through. I just don't want, because, you know, for them it was stress too. I didn't, why we got letter last minute? Because this was, was like, we talked with uh, Peter and we come to a conclusion, what if, because we're begging with the families, we're lo getting a long time, like, what if I ask Larissa if she know the whole, what I'm going through? And you know what she said, like, what happened, it happens. So I never let you down because she saw, you know, with kids, being a student, I'm not telling you, it's really hard. Because they don't you see a student, and they don't, you have your due dates, you have projects, you have exam. Your mommy first. Mommy, I need it. And I did it together. Of course, we supported my family, but I don't know. I just want to 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 have my PA, uh, pharmacy degree and serve a community and be a loyal pharmacist and show and prove that whatever happened, it's not me. It was not my character. Oh, oh uh, I did want to say, make, make clear. You drive 100 miles a day. You yeah. volunteer someplace 40 hours a month. You have three kids, is that right? It's right. And my son, <laughs> and my son, Yang, is one turn today nine months. I was pregnant during the pharmacy school too. <laughs> Second year, actually. I'm sorry. I have a question. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I switched directions on you. <laughs> okay. Um, you you had your friend's card, so she had given you the card, right? How else would you? See. Yeah, no, she gave it to me. Okay. And um, I, I see, you know, based on what I'm, I, I see as far as the recommendation of the director of the university, um, I'm looking at uh, the letters that you provided and what they had to say about you and, and the fact that your friend gave you the card. I totally agree with my colleague here. <laughs> No questions. Well, I tell you, I'm just impressed that you did uh, pharmacy school with two pregnancies because that's, you know your brain just goes away. So, um, that, that's impressive. I feel I'm going all. through dim <laughs> dimension. <laughs> it's harder to pay. Yes. <laughs> it's I guess you're smart during pregnancy. I, I, I don't me. think so. <laughs> you I know, have four. That's why I can say uh, that's right. one of my <laughs> two, one of my preceptors. They're like. Be lucky that we're not charging you two tuitions <laughs> with your baby. Yes. Um, so I just have a question about the, the letter. Um, it looks like it's, it's like the name's printed. Does that, did someone at your office write that name? No, I went yesterday and we wrote in my computer, printed out. And she, you know, she's not, uh, she's from Germany. And they, so this is the way they okay. she wrote out his uh, her name. She's... Okay. It's actually not that uncommon in European countries yeah, to, to sign not using cursive. Yeah. You are a culture. Of this, 
culture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> more, more culture than me, because I wasn't going to submit it. it wasn't yes, so that, that's quite common in German, okay. German culture. Thank you. Um, I just need to clarify one thing. So when the intern license is on probation, so what kind of hard time do they give you on the APP? Uh, they don't want me to be there in their allow, pharmacy. They, they wouldn't allow you to go on the APP. No, they, they allow. By law, I can go. The preceptors and the owners, they don't want me to be there. Oh, I see. It's only the preceptors. They're yeah. like, no, we don't want somebody with probation because we don't, they're doing the truth. We don't want board the pharmacy here. Oh, okay. Because I'm constantly monitoring uh, with my inspector, and I'm doing my, you know, how it works. So they, want, they don't want to. They don't want to draw extra inspections. Yeah, this is true. Because otherwise, I thought it was just supervised uh, no. internship, which which they have to be under supervised anyway. As an intern, you you can't supervise anybody. So, okay, I I just I'm trying to figure out what the hard time you would have with that no. restriction. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Could I possibly get that letter back? Yes. Thank you. I have a question about the letter. And uh, I, I feel the same way as everybody else does. I mean, what you've gone through and the fact that you've uh, been able to, uh, to continue your education and have uh, children at the same time. I mean, my wife and I waited until we were well in business before we became parents. So we, my hat is off to you. Regarding this letter, however, um, um, the, uh, the reset. Talks about how you know she really given you the card uh, and she used it. You had she had you had her permission, obviously. But then later in the letter it said it says aside from this one event, I have never known Marine to be dishonest or untruthful. And it kind of contradicts, you know, her. Uh, no, but it's because we had the kind of a fight thing because she's kind of putting me down. Why right? when I said after in the court she didn't even appear it. In the court. Yeah, well, she talks about that, but then, you know, she says, well, maybe I'm it's her it. English. And then she kind says, of. well, you know, she's never been dishonest except for this one event. I'm not quite sure what the clarity I guess it's the, the English, how well, he interpreted it. Well, uh, because I'll, you introduced it. And I, I would comment on that. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, to me, the, the dishonest event was what she told the police in 2009. She didn't tell them, I'm not guilty. I have Larissa's card with Larissa's permission. She was protecting Larissa. She was in a, a very strange circumstance. She's in the security office of Bloomingdale's with people telling her, you're using a stolen card and you're guilty. And a person of third language who came from European countries, um, it, it's different. It's, it's, it's different. So. Um, I'm, I'm not going to try to read Larissa's mind as to what she yeah, meant, she's, she's, but, but to me, the only, yeah. the only single instance of being untruthful was that instance. And she tried to correct it in her application by telling the truth, which... Which appeared that I'm lying to the, now to the board. Well, I'm glad I asked you, because that's possible. Thank you. So, so if the board uh, have a letter that uh, guarantee that we will not send the inspector over, will that take care of <laughs> Very good point. My inspector, Dr. Steele, she said to me that, guarantee them I'm not coming there. Believe me, not I did that. that. What? <laughs> she, they're, my, my both inspectors, they are very kind and they're supportive. They're helping me. They're like, other people using should should use you as a resource. I'm like, really? They, yeah. they hate me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no further question. All right, thank you. Any additional uh, any additional questions? Nothing further. Um, any additional witnesses? Um, Maureen's husband is here for moral support. He came from Los Angeles with her. Again, English is not his first language. He feels a little uncomfortable in settings. But if yes, letter. the board or, or your honor have any questions, he did submit an affidavit. Oh, okay. um, that's Aaron. Get, 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 go, back in. go back in. Go back in. Um, but if you have any questions of him. All right. No, it's OK. All right. All right, so I think I'm hearing that we, the affidavit is enough. I've been sitting here pretty white. <laughs> All right. You have a supportive husband that will come here He's and stand very by you. So kudos to your husband. Thank you. Any closing argument, then? Just very briefly, and it's not really so much of a closing argument, but it's going to follow up what the prior counsel said at the, in his closing. And he talked about punishment. And I don't look at this so much as the board imposing punishment. They, they, they discipline 
licensees, which led me to go last night to the Oxford Dictionary and said, what, what really is discipline? Because I know when I discipline my kids, sometimes I punish them, or sometimes I discipline them without punishment, but tr try to keep them on a straight and narrow. This definition said it's the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior, using punishment to correct disobedience. Some people will never get it, no matter how much you punish them. I think you have to have a conscience to learn from your mistakes, a conscience to learn from the punishment. Maureen has certainly learned. She, she has been punished criminally in, in the courts. She did jail time. She did three years probation. She satisfied our state criminally, and they dismissed that case against her. She's been living with this probation. She has learned. And I think if anyone deserves a, a reduced probation or termination of the probationary period, it's Marine. Give this young lady the opportunity to further her education, and, and I guarantee you she will be a good pharmacist. And she will never be in trouble again. I just have that sense from knowing her. Thank you. Mr. Rome, any additional? Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Sanchez okay. had one oh, thing. I apologize. Let me just sort of like this. When you go out there and uh, you get the bad reputation that somehow we're going to get this right, <laughs> we'll give anybody a break. You know, we're, we're really hard on parents. Uh, but that's not the case. If you see everybody here, it's you. And you look at every case individually. differently, but we give you a break short on that. And so hopefully you can carry that message out there. Thank you. And by the way, I so far, I hope in future as well too that every member of Board of Farms I met were the nicest people. Yeah. <laughs> it's not I'm telling in front of you, I just told I forgot, sorry, I forgot your name. She was one of the smile that always cheering me up every time we had the board meeting with her. Thank you. I really appreciate your time and believing in me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Then the record is now closed and the matter is submitted. We're off the record in this matter. Thank you so much. And we'll proceed to the next petition. Mary French. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, with Mr. Balfour. <laughs> All right, are we on the record? All right, good afternoon. We're on the record in the matter of the petition uh, for production, uh, penalty relief filed by Mary Alice French. This is Office of Administrative Hearings, case number 2017-030765. Today is March 30th, 2017. And may I have appearances of the board members beginning with Alan Shad, professional member. Ricardo Sanchez, public member. Lavonza Butler, professional member. Amy Gutierrez, professional member. Debbie Beal, professional member. Victor Law, professional member. Stan Weiser, professional member. Albert Wall, professional member. And my name is Marilyn Willard. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. I've been assigned to preside over this matter. We do have a quorum here today. Uh, may I have the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General? Supervising Deputy Attorney General Joshua Room appearing on behalf of the people pursuant to Government Code 11522. Good afternoon, Ms. French. I know you've had a, a lengthy day here. That's okay. been here since very early this morning. It's all right. And um, I, I understand you're representing yourself today here. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And you're a little soft-spoken, so I'm just going to oh. encourage you to speak up and maybe pull that microphone a little closer oh. to you. 
Okay. Um, yeah. cool. So, so you, uh, you and I met in a, in a meeting before we began the hearings today, yes. and I know you've sat through some of the hearings and heard the explanation about the hearing process. Do you have any questions about how we're going to proceed today? No. All right. All right. So um, you do understand you have the right to testify on your own behalf, to call any additional witnesses, and to explain to the board why you believe your petition should be granted. Yes. Mr. Room will begin with an, an overview of the case and, and uh, address the exhibits, and you can begin to, at this point, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, this is actually Ms. French's third appearance before the board uh, since her the original discipline. There were two prior petitions for reinstatement, and then and then this petition. So I'll go through that history a little bit in what I in the documents. Uh, first document I placed before Your Honor is the one-page agreement to electronic recording of hearing signed by Ms. French. I ask that that be marked and admitted. No. And then the second exhibit contains uh, Ms. Uh, French's petition. She actually, uh, there was some back and forth between she and board staff, so there are a total of three petitions there. Um, it appears that Ms. French was both requesting uh, elimination or reduction of the number of tests she has to take as testing frequency, but then also asking to have her uh, probation terminated early. Didn't necessarily use the right form for that, but the intent has become clear by way of further elucidation. Uh, questions asked of, by staff. So there's a total of three petitions included in there, um, mostly duplicative. There's, there's some slight differences between them, so that's why they're all included. Um, in addition, there are uh, typewritten pages by petitioner answering all the, fully, more fully answering the petition questions. There's a certificate of appreciation from the Red Cross for Ms. French's participation in the 2005 hurricane relief effort. Um, there's a letter, uh, there, there are two different letters from the board documenting her July 11, 2014 uh, passage of the CPJE and her October 31st, 2012 passage of NAPLEX, the uh, state, uh, uh, nationwide exam. Um, there are 70 pages of drug test results, mostly from 2010 and 2011. There's one from 2016 um, with mostly negative tests but with positive test results for antidepressants. Um, there's 11 pages of credit card statements uh, documenting payments for drug testing in 2014 and 15. Um, there's nine pages of invoices from RX Prep for uh, NAPLEX preparation materials and courses. Um, there's a one-page summary in which Ms. French estimates the costs of rehabilitation to, to the date of that document of $29,180. Um, included in that, in the next two pages, are some uh, bills from a doctor, from a dentist for dental work, about twenty-four hundred dollars worth. Um, there are certificates for thirty-one hours of board-approved CE be completed between November two thousand fourteen and May two thousand sixteen. Um, this petition was actually filed uh, in October two thousand sixteen, so that's that was more timely at that time. Um, and then there are letters of recommendation, a total of seven of them. Two of them are, are from board licensees, a pharmacist, and a technician. One is from, a, from her personal doctor, from a, an MD, and then there are four from private citizens. Five of those seven, the authorship was verified. Ask that those be marked and admitted, Your Honor. And I would uh, just indicate that as to each of the three petitions, uh, the date of birth and the president's address will be redacted. Thank you, Your Honor. Any objection uh, to the admission of Exhibit B here? No. All right, B is admitted. And then there are two sets of underlying uh, administrative documents. The first is the original accusation, which was filed back in 2003, case number 2520. Alleged seven causes for discipline arising from petitioner's conduct in, in 2000 and 2001 of stealing and diverting for her own use from the drug stock of her employer and administering to herself, including consuming while on duty as a staff pharmacist, controlled substances, and dangerous drugs. The drugs in question included Hydromet, Hycamine, Hycatus, and Tussinex. These are all combination cough preparations with hydrocodone. Ativan, an, uh, lorazepam, an anxiety drug. Tylenol with codeine elixir and Feldine, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. While working as a relief pharmacist at various Long's drug stores in San Diego, she was also at this time the pharmacist in charge at a Kaiser pharmacy in San Diego, petitioner drank the liquids, liquids at work and took other drugs home with her. Long's audits revealed shortages of significant quality quantities of Hydromet, Tussinex, and Ativan. The causes for discipline were for self-administration, unauthorized possession, self-furnishing, adulteration um, by returning bottles she drank from to the shelf, being under the influence while on duty, 
dispensing without a prescription and failing to prevent theft in the ph pharma pharmacy for which she was responsible as the on-duty pharmacist. On December 4th, 2003, mm -hmm. petitioner and her counsel, Douglas Gaiman, signed a stipulated revocation of license and order, admitting the entire accusation and agreeing to revocation of her pharmacist license. Petitioner also agreed to pay $8,000 in costs prior to issuance of a new or reinstated license from the board. That decision and order was adopted effective April 7th, 2004. Ask that that be marked and admitted, Your Honor. Any objection to that, this document? No. It has to be marked and admitted as, as Exhibit C. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, petitioner then appeared twice before the board seeking reinstatement. Her first petition for reinstatement was filed and heard in 2007, and that, that petition was denied. She filed a second petition for reinstatement in July 2010. It was heard in February 2011, and it was granted. Her pharmacist license number 35330 was reinstated upon completion of four preconditions. She had to take, she had to take and pass the NAPLEX and the CPJE with one, within one year. She had to pay the fee for those exams. She had to submit a completed application, and she had to pay a reinsta reinstatement fee of $150. Then the license would be reinstated, immediately revoked, with revocation stayed in favor of a period of probation of five years, standard terms and conditions, including payment of the original $8,000 in costs, plus terms including random drug screening, abstention, prescription coordinated monitoring, and no supervision of ancillary personnel. That decision and the order and order of the board granting the petition for reinstatement was made effective October 27, 2011. Ask that that be marked and admitted, Your Honor. Any objection to Exhibit D? No. So admitted. Ms. French is now 64 years old. She was issued her pharmacist license 35330 on April 2, 1980. It was revoked on April 7, 2004 and reinstated effective October 27, 2011. However, the license was not actually reissued until August 6, 2014, after she had completed the NAPLEX, the CPJE, the, the application, and the fee. The license is current and active through September 30th, 2018. There is no other license reported. Um, I won't go through all the detailed allegations of the original accusation again, but all of those uh, diversion and self-administration uh, allegations resulted in a, uh, a fully admitted accusation um, that resulted in revocation effective April 7, 2004. Reinstatement was made effective October 27, 2011. She completed the preconditions to receipt of her license, and her license was reissued on August 6, 2014. So her five-year probation actually began on that date. So her, her probation uh, is set to terminate on August 5, 2019, absent an extension or early termination. Under that term, she has served about two and a half years of that five-year term and seeks to terminate about two years early by the time the board's decision would be issued or, or seeks to modify terms. Um, again, just to specify her, she is seeking either an early termination or a reduction in the frequency of drug testing. A petitioner has been generally compliant with the terms and conditions of a probation. It obviously took her more than the one year that was originally contemplated to complete the CPJE and the, and the NAPLEX exams, which she did not complete until approximately three, a little bit more than three years later, uh, in July 2014. Um, she submitted the necessary application and license fee. She's had uh, eight non-compliance letters regarding her failure to complete drug testing, which basically means eight missed tests, but no, no positive tests. Um, you've had eight letters issued about missing uh, drug tests, not not calling in on a certain day. Oh, not calling. No, yeah, oh, not, yeah. Oh, okay. not missing tests. I mean, fa failing to call. Oh, in. I was going to say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the last time that happened was in January 2017. She's paid all of her probation monitoring fees and is compliant with prescription monitoring. She's made payments toward the eight thousand dollar cost recovery. She has a balance uh, of three thousand six hundred and forty eight dollars, which may have been updated since then, but that's the balance at the time I was told. Um, Business and Professionals Code 4309A2 requires a two-year lapse before a petition for early termination of probation. Um, so her petition was proper any time after August 6, 2016. Um, and similarly, it requires one year lapse before a petition seeking modification of a term. So that was August 6, 2015. The petition is supported by the requisite number of letters from board licensees, two, and private citizens. She has five. It is also supported by 31 hours of board-approved CE during the applicable period. I submit subject to cross-examination, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. French, I just wanted to verify, uh, do you have any additional exhibits that are not included in what we've discussed so far? No. All right. Thank you. 
All right, so may I ask you to please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under pen uh, penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth and the whole truth? I do. All right, thank you. Um, obviously, you're representing yourself. This is your opportunity to address the board and right. uh, to advise them of why you believe your petition should be granted. Okay. Um, I've waited for this day for 13 years. Um, from the day I, left, I lost my license, um, I looked for help uh, online and could find nothing. Uh, I looked for four years. Um, in 2007, uh, I came up and went, th went to the board, and they denied me, rightly so, because I did not have my drinking under control at all. Um, so after uh, I left the board, that in 2007, December, um, I became very ill, and my appendix ruptured, uh, and I was put into the hospital for emergency surgery. While I was coming out of anesthesia, I went into uh, uh, contractions, seizures, uh, and I was put into ICU for five days. They told my daughter that I might not live through it, um, and her boyfriend rushed home to support her. Um, I got out of the hospital, left her 17 days, and um, the next morning my ceiling fell in. It really fell in. It was bam. So, um, so I sat there and looked through the through the roof, and uh, and I, I just said, "That's it. That's it. I, I've got to do something." Uh, so I went to see an old friend, uh, Joe Bitterman. And uh, he referred me to a pharmacist that was working at Long's uh, that, that had been in recovery. And um, I think his name was Michael. And he, he sent me to the professional um, uh, uh, pharmacy professional or, or professionals uh, recovery group with Dwayne, um, what's Dwayne's last name? I know, Rogers. Dwayne Rogers, yes. Uh, so I was I was so excited about that. Uh, I was grateful that they were were helping me. Uh, so I went through um, the program with Dwayne Rogers from, from June of 2008 until fall of 2012. Um, I wasn't required to do that last year, but but I just I didn't want to take any chances. Uh, you know, I just wanted to stay in recovery. Um, so I took. I studied, and I took the board, and um, I, I passed the NAPLEX within the one year. Um, I did not pass the California board. So um, I went home, and, and I studied for a couple more, more years and passed that. I did pretty well. I got Bs for my tests, uh, 85, 86, something like that. Um, so uh, I was so excited uh, when I passed my, my boards. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get to work. Uh, but I didn't realize what was on my, uh, um, what my restrictions were on probation. So I, I've listened to the other pharmacists here today um, talk about how hard it is to get a job when you're on probation. And especially when you can't check texts and clerks. Um, I, I did get to work in a pharmacy. I worked for 20 hours a week at no pay. Um, but I was taking care of um, my, my patient, um, Mr. Cheney, 40 hours a week at, the, at that time, too. And um, I, I tried to work, work around the prohibition of supervising clerks and techs, and it was, it was, it was hard. It was really hard. Um, the, the pharmacist got so sick of me because the, the board inspector would come in and pull him aside for an hour. and. Um, I don't know if you've ever had worked with a clerk that's, that's worked there for a million years, and, and now she's a pharmacist. Um, but I think it's dangerous when you um, when you make a pharmacist um, weak, when you make a pharmacist not be able to, to do their job uh, to supervise clerks and techs, uh, because some of them do need to be supervised. Or they, they will do whatever they please. Um, so I, I didn't understand that. But um, 
I worked there for seven months. And um, after that, I just went back to um, working with um, Mr. Cheney. I was doing senior care for him. Uh, and I, I, I couldn't get another job. Um, so I waited. And um, in the meantime, Mr. Cheney passed away um, in December of last year. And um, so now I'm working with a, a senior care company called A Passion for Care. Uh, they're a small company. They only have 10 clients. And so right now I'm taking care of a, a lovely woman who uh, was on hospice when we started with her. And we've, we've worked so hard with her that now she's in transition. So she's come out of hospice. And that's fantastic. Um, so, and I, I do love working uh, with that age group um, because of my grandparents, I think. But I will persist. I will persist. Um, I've been working on this for a long time. I was the first one in my family to graduate college. Um, my father had a, a third grade education, um, but he worked two jobs his whole life. He was a um, commercial fisherman. And he also worked for the Iowa Ordnance Plant in Burlington, Iowa. Um, and I worked with him on the boat. Uh, my father was exceptional. He, he never said to me, you're a girl. You can't do this. Nobody ever, ever said that to me. Um, and from him, I learned hard work and any kind of work. I, I worked in a soybean field with a machete, cutting out jimson weed uh, when I was 12. Um, my whole life, when I started as a pharmacist, I worked two jobs. I had a husband that was very ill um, and who did not feel that it was necessary for him to work. Um, my marriage was not easy. Um, when, when he would get uh, physical with me in front of the children, I would have to ask him to leave the house. Um, and I, um, at one time, at, at one time, um, he had to leave for a year before I would allow him back. Um, so I, I worked a lot of hours my whole life. Um, I've been very persistent in bettering myself. I'm very proud of my drug testing um, because I've never had a failure. And um, I just hope that, that you'll allow me to come back um, and work as a pharmacist again. It's what I love. It's why I've pers persisted for 13 years. Um, and I'm, the, the drug testing, it's, I'm making $14 an hour. And I work 60 hours a week, 12-hour um, shifts, and, and sometimes 24-hour shifts. Um, and, and that's fine. You know, that's OK. But I, but I just, I'm going to lose my home. Uh, that's the last thing I have. Um, so I, I'm asking you to trust me again. It's been a long time. And I've been in AA for almost nine years now. And I, and I am an alcoholic and an addict. And that's why I stay in AA. Um, gosh, I'm old enough that I've learned my lesson. I, I work hard to stay physically fit. I do weights, thank you. I do weights and I do extreme aqua fit. Um, I have great abs. <laughs> you know, man. So, because I want, because I want to be able to work for another twenty years. Um, yeah, I've got one hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of student loans to pay for my kids, um, and um, I just want to keep my home, um, so my dogs and I can live there together. And I want to make this up to my children. <laughs> my son was 13 when his dad died. 
and they called at three o'clock in the morning and he came out and said, is it real? And I said, yes. And he ran to his bed and screamed. I kind of gave up. My husband died in 1999 on uh, March 13th, 99. And um, I think I kind of, I just laid down and didn't care whether I kept going anymore. And I don't know why, because that marriage was not that hot. <laughs> <laughs> he told me at one time that sex five times a day was normal for a, a married couple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, a sense of humor helps. Um, so anyway, my, my son's gone through a lot of, uh, of heartache and... And I worked hard because I want to show them if you work, if you persist, you can accomplish things. And I think that my faith my faith is special. I don't do the steps of AA. And there's a reason for that. I, I, I tried doing the steps for years. And I had the same sponsor for eight years. And I just couldn't give my will away the way AA wants you to. So I finally went and looked up my faith. And, and how many of us go back and look 200 years ago to see where our, our faith comes from? Um, in the 1600s, uh, two people were, were, were setting the, the style of religion for the next couple hundred years. They were the Calvinists and Arminians. Uh, the Calvinists uh, believe that when you're born, that you're, you have predestination. You're either going to heaven or hell, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, my faith, I'm a Methodist, and we go with the Wesleyan um, Arminianson, which says that God, through his divine grace, gave us free will. And our, it's our responsibility to admit when we've done wrong and pay for it. I, I, don't, I don't turn my everything over to God. I can't do that. And that's why I haven't worked the steps. But yesterday, I was so worried about talking about AA. And I looked in the big book, and it said that these steps are just a suggestion. And I'd never seen that before. And I felt like such a weight off of me because I'm worried about about complying. Uh, but I still go to AA. I love AA. I, I go to the women's group in La Mesa on Saturday mornings um, when, I, when I don't have to work. Uh, and it's a group of about 50 women. Some of the women in there have 30 years of, of sobriety. And... Um, I go there for the companionship and to be with other women who've been hurt and who feel like this is the way forward. It's sobriety. And um, I'm sorry. I didn't want to cry. I felt sorry for those other girls that couldn't get jobs, you know. Uh, I also uh, want to make the last 13 years of my life mean something. So um, I've asked my attorney, David Balfour, to go with me to uh, UCSD, Skaggs, Co uh, Skaggs School of Pharmacy, and I would like to tell the students there what I did, how I got there, and, and explain to them how you don't do that, because nobody talks to them. I, what you said was right. What you said was right. They need that ethics before they get out of school. I, that's where I get my health care. And so I talk to pharmacy students when I see them, you know, going in for an, an office visit. And I ask them, has anybody talked to you about, about drug addiction and the dangers that are out? No, they haven't. So if I can go and, and tell them what I've experienced and what hell it is, and where the line is, 
the line is right in front of you and you reach out to take that bottle off the shelf. If you ever do that, you need help right now. Because if you don't get help, you're going to go down my road. And that, that's hard. That road is very hard. So um, I sent David a, an email yesterday, and I said, "Are you still on for the uh, to, for the pharmacy school?" And he said, "Oh yeah." Um, and then he said, "After that, we're going to take it to other pharmacy schools." And I said, "Well, I'm I'm going to have to get. Um, I haven't left San Diego except to come and see you guys uh, for the past eight years because I've always been afraid that I would mess up on a test." Um, so maybe if I can get through probation somehow, I can, uh, David and I can go to other schools in California um, and speak to them too. Uh, but I hope that you do pass a law that we need ethics and we need to talk about pharmacists and addiction before they get out of school. So I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. French, uh, from when do you, what date do you date your sobriety? I date my, um, I, dra I date my um, drug sobriety to uh, October of 2003. Uh, that's when I lost my last job and that's when I went into detox. Um, and, and you know, I don't have I'm sure I could get a date, but my uh, my AA birthday is on August 24th, and this year will be my ninth year of sobriety, and um, I'm very proud of that. I uh, my sponsor for eight years moved to Tucson, uh, so I have a new sponsor now, and uh, her name is Marin, and um, I've told her that I have some issues. Uh, you know, in regards to faith, my my faith and my church and, and the big book uh, and the steps. And she said, that's okay. You know, it's not mandatory. So I'm happy to have such a, <laughs> such a great sponsor. She, she lives in my neighborhood so I can walk down the street and visit her. And uh, let's see, did, that, did I answer the question? You did, thank you. Okay. Um, and for how many years prior to 2008 for alcohol and 2003 for drugs, would you say you were an active user of those substances? I'd say, um, let's see, my, my husband died in 99, and I would say um, six months before that. And would you say that you were an alcoholic first who uh, turned to drugs or vice versa, or they were sort of simultaneous? Uh, I think I turned to drugs first. Um, I, I uh, really, I didn't want to drink much. My husband wanted me to drink with him, or it made him mad. Uh, so, you know, I have to admit that giving up alcohol has been pretty easy for me. Um, but I'd say drugs first. When I, when I was um, in sixth grade, uh, I was 12, and I started getting migraine with aura. Uh, at that time, uh, nobody knew about migraine. And uh, so they gave me Actifed for it. Um, but I had the most extreme kind of migraine. I had um, migraine with aura, and then there's another term for it too. But first you lose your vision, half of your vision, and then you know that you have a half an hour and then the pain's going to start. And I would cry and run. I would run from bed to bed. Uh, I eventually learned that if I stuck my finger down my throat that I could vomit and that would help. Um, and all through high school I was having three or four of those a month. Um, I never understood why they didn't help me with the pain. My mother was a nurse. My mom was a nurse. So um, when I started a job in, as a pharmacist, it was in Mesa, Arizona. And one day I, I couldn't go in because I had 
I had an aura, and I knew that I had a migraine coming. So I went to Dr. Thomas, who was across the street uh, from, from the store. It was Revco. You remember Revco? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, and um, Dr. Thompson gave me um, Caffergot and Tylenol codeine. And that, that was just like the sky opened up because all of a sudden my pain was treated. Um, so over the years, I think I just like back patients and migraine patients, you, you start to rely on pain medication. And I think that over the next 20 years, um, I, I relied on it. And when I got to a point where I didn't care anymore, I just, I just said, I, I, I like this, I'm going to take this. And, and the problem, the problem, I think, what differentiates people from an alcoholic or, or someone that's not alcoholic, if you take a drink of wine and you fall asleep, well, you're not going to be an alcoholic. You're going to be a terrible alcoholic. If you take a drink of wine and you go yahoo and start dancing on the table, uh, then you're going to be a great alcoholic. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. Um, and the same applies uh, to hydrocodone. Um, you know, people will take it and they, and they just makes them feel horrible. They lay down, they're out, you know, for the next day. Me, I would go up. And so that's one thing I would tell people. If, if you take something like that and, and you get a reaction like that, then you'd better worry about it and, and be very careful about what you do. So what do you, I'm sorry, yes. what, do you, what do you currently do? Do you still suffer from migraines? And what do you currently do to manage that pain or any other pain? No, I, I don't have migraine anymore. Um, after my 40s, uh, it, it became less and less. Actually, after my children, it became less. Um, and because you already had headaches. I them. had migraine. Yeah, <laughs> I already, oh, I had headaches. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. I forgot about those headaches. Yeah. Um, so what do you currently use for pain management, if you have any? Uh, I don't have any. You don't? Okay. No. And, and I think, uh, and I, I just did have back problems. Uh, I messed up my back doing yoga and um, for a long time. So uh, guess what? Cymbalta works great right for my back. And uh, exercising hard, which I do. I do the uh, extreme AquaFit now. Uh, as many days of a, of a week, many days in the week I can. And um, when, when I hear people say, oh, I ache, you know, I just feel like saying to them, that's because you don't exercise. If I stop exercising, if I don't exercise as hard as I can, yeah, I get up in the morning and I feel like an old lady, you know. And, and they talk about fibromyalgia, and, you know. I swear, if those people would exercise, I don't think, I don't think they'd feel that way. I, uh, that's that's my. I want to keep going for another twenty years, and that and that. Yeah, I want to keep going, and I'm not. I'm not going to get old. I'm going to fight it the whole way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that means I'll work hard. I will work hard to keep myself fit. So, um, given that drugs available in a pharmacy were your first drugs of abuse, mm -hmm. and up to now, you haven't been in a pharmacy except on under terms of probation. Mm -hmm. What what gives you confidence that if you are to work in a pharmacy unsupervised, you would not feel the temptation of those drugs again? You know, I the the first day I went to work in that pharmacy, I was nervous, and I thought, "What's going to happen? You know, how am I going to feel?" and at the end of the first day, I, I went, okay, that was, we made it through a day. And then the days after that, I, I started to realize that I could handle this. I, I got a little spastic about counting every pill in the pharmacy all the time to make sure they had, they were all there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, w I was excited about it. I was excited about it. Um, and I'm just too old. I, I can't go back and do this stuff. I want I want grandchildren. 
And they're in, not in a big hurry to give me grandchildren, so <laughs> I'm going to have to keep going here. Um, yeah, I, I worked so much when my children were little, I, I sometimes I feel I don't know them. Um, I always worked two jobs. So um, there's a lot of things I'd say to young pharmacists, actually. So one of the... Uh one of your letters uh, of recommendation was really sort of a medical assessment from Dr. Ayers. Mm -hmm. Can you do, can you just sort of give a brief overview of what treatment you're undergoing with Dr. Ayers or what his role is in your life? Uh, I was I've, I've been going to a doctor on a monthly basis uh, since 2003. Um, they started me on Suboxone uh, in 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 2003. Um, I had tried to detox on my own in 2001 when I lost a job. And uh, I was too ashamed to go to the emergency room. So I just lay down at home and over six weeks um, I lost 40 pounds. My my gums receded and I've had to, that's what the dental work is. I had to have that filled in. I never got that back. Um, and I, I couldn't eat. My, I remember my doc, my daughter coming into the room and saying, Mom, you just have to at least drink some water. Um, and I had the kicking and the muscle that, you know, it's like this. I can't even, it's like an itch, and it just goes on and on and on. Um, so, um, yeah, and that was 2001. I went back to work. That that didn't help. I was back at it in 2001 with the drugs. So in 2003, um, all of a sudden they had Suboxone. So when I went into uh, rehab at uh, oh, Mesa Vista, uh, they put me on Suboxone, and that was that was such a gift. That was such a gift. Um, the problem with my Suboxone is that over these years, none of my doctors suggested that I stop taking it. I, I was sensitive because I'd lost my license because I was my own doctor and treated myself. And I swore I was not going to do that again. So... Um, Let's see, the last doctor, I had, I had Dr. Jackson up to 2008, I think, maybe beyond that. And sometimes I think these doctors are, are using Suboxone as uh, an easy way to make money. Um, and and I, th I think also that we need to have an answer about, okay, you've got them off of the, of the OxyContin, now how do you get them off the Suboxone? Um, and I'm down to, um, I take a quarter of a milligram twice a day. Um, the last time I, I tried to stop, um, I was good for two days. But as soon as I get up to 72 days, then all the muscle contractions start happening. Um, I, I've tried doing a child's pose on the floor to try to keep my legs still. You know, you can't stay like that forever. <laughs> uh, but um, I asked Dr. Um, Dr. Ayers if, um, if he could, you know, put me in Mesa Vista for a couple days. And he said, well, he thought it'd take six weeks. Uh, I, I don't think it takes six weeks. I don't know. He's the doctor. Um, but this is dangerous, taking Suboxone. When, when my appendix ruptured, the, they couldn't convince the doctor that I was on Suboxone and that the only drug that, that will go past Suboxone for pain is fentanyl. Um, and once they find out you're on Suboxone, boy, your name is, is mud anyway. Uh, I, I fell and crushed my ankle. Um, and my daughter tried to explain to the doctor um, that I was on Suboxone, he, you know, didn't listen. They put me on, a, uh, he tried to shove my, my foot back on my leg, 
that was, anyway. Uh, so they rolled me into a hallway and left me there by myself. And I had no pain medication. And I lay there and screamed for a half an hour. And I could hear voices. And nobody would come. And that's, that's where the danger lies for me. I, I went in uh, to the emergency room last year uh, with a bowel obstruction. And who knew that was... That was painful. And at first, the, the nurse understood. But then that shift went home, and a new shift went, came on. And um, they were not going to give me pain medication. She said, I'll give you Dilaudid. I'll give you Dilaudid. I said, I, said, I said, it doesn't work. And she goes, well, that's the way it is. So I, I was. I, that's the kind of situation I get in. Um, and things will happen to me where I'm going to be in a lot of pain. And that, that's not a good place to be. That and the fact that you feel trapped. Oh my god, do I have my Suboxone to take to work with me today? Because if, if I don't, and I start going into withdrawal, my skin is going to burn. I'm going to start sneezing or yawning. And, and then eventually I'll, I'll go into muscle contractions. So. I can't work that way. Um, I, I asked Dr. Ayers if he could give me uh, something for the muscle, muscle spastic, spasticity um, to try to get me through that period. And he said that he didn't think that, that the board would allow it. Um, but I have to get off of this. I, I have to get off of this. I can't keep doing this. It's no way to live. And um, I don't know. Maybe you have an answer for that. So you've been on Suboxone for 14 years, approximately? Yep. Yes. Um, now, you've heard me ask the same question of prior petitioners. Mm -hmm. At the time you were reinstated, mm -hmm. the board believed that a five-year probation, a five-year active probation with a license was appropriate. Mm -hmm. You've served about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Why should the board either cut that time in half, mm -hmm. or why should they, you know, eliminate or reduce the drug testing that they thought was necessary during that entire five-year period? What What about your circumstances has changed, or do you think justifies treating you in that special way? I, I feel like um, my experience with the board started in 2008. Um, and that's when I got recovery, and that's when I started working um, to get my license back. I've been good since 2008. I, I have been just as straight as I can be. Um, so now <clears throat> it's eight hours. It's eight years later. <clears throat> Excuse me, almost nine hours. Nine years later, and um, and I'm running out of time. Um, Paying for the drug testing and and I'm not making much money. Um, I'm down to pretty much credit cards gone, and um, I don't have anyone that can help me. And um, I feel like I've been in in some kind of probation for eight years, and uh, and I've, I've done my absolute best to be perfect about it, because that's what we do. Pharmacists have to be obsessive about perfection. Um, so it, it doesn't feel like two years to me. It feels like eight years to me. And, and I don't know what I could do to show you. Um, I don't know what I could do. So um, one of the terms of, and conditions of your probation is that you work as a pharmacist for 20 hours a week. Um, it doesn't sound as if you've been successful in doing that for mm -hmm. all of your time. Is that correct? That's right. Um, uh, have you gotten any noncompliance letters about that, or have you just sort no. of worked that out with your probation monitor? Yeah, no one said anything to me. About okay. It. So, um, do you have anyone with whom you've spoken about employment as a pharmacist? Do you have any job prospects? Uh, yeah, the criminal just uh, the the. Um, Criminal, um, the the um, prison, 
system, asked um, me if I could work for them. I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, but they can't take me on probation. Um, I get, you know, you get those things in your emails, you know, here's a job, here's a job. Um, but I, I haven't, I, well, when I look at them to apply to them, it always says must have a clear license. And, and, and I'm not young, and they're not going to take me unless I, I'm, I'm pretty perfect. They just don't, why should they? Um, so, yeah, now that you mention it, that is, I didn't remember that. I, um, I know this is a difficult question to answer right now, given your financial circumstances, but mm -hmm. if you were uh, either terminated early or your terms were changed such that you were better able to work, would you be willing and able to repay the remaining cost recovery? Oh, of course. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's all I have at this point, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Any questions from the board members? Yes. I do have a few. Well, I'm glad when I speak, somebody listening out there, I wish the board member listened to me when I talk. <laughs> we all hear you, Albert. <laughs> um, so you you still on... So all this testing mm -hmm. that you are negative right now. So no positive tests, right? No, never. And um, well, you know when when you exercise, you know you do relieve, have the endorphin. That's what <laughs> you call it. I don't have the pain anymore. So keep keep up the exercise. Um, so I I think Josh just asked the question. So you don't. So you're not working that many hours. So um, no, I, it's impossible. So, I I can't work. So is there any place where you could volunteer? Maybe like the, like this when you say the prison service, you could you know a lot of time you know I I notice it a lot of students come in here they volunteer this volunteer that and offer places mm -hmm. you know when we need help and they're the one next one to be hired you know so yeah. you know, I encourage you to look for something like that. I I I tried working seven months that way. Yeah. And in a pharmacy because I'm a retail pharmacist, yeah. I'm not a hospital pharmacist, and and it was. It was horrible. It was really horrible. That pharmacist was ready to kick me out of there. So, he was so, so mad so at me. So your main problem is that because you're, you had, you're being tagged as a probation, that's why you cannot find a job. Right? Because Yes, because it was so difficult for him. He said he would never hire another person on probation again. Yeah. Uh, well, keep trying on it. I think yeah. uh, you will get there. I, I also have worked... Um, uh, at um, the Crisis Center at uh, Presbyterian Urban Ministries. Um, I work three hours every Thursday morning, and uh, we, we gave out um, money and applications for IDs so people could get jobs. A lot of times the police take their IDs away from them. I don't know what that's about, but, but we get a lot of homeless um, in San Diego. And um, the, it's a little house downtown and it's been there for 40 years. And so I worked there um, three hours every Thursday for eight years. And uh, I only gave it up recently because I can't work 60 hours a week at a job and, and do that too. But but um, get a lot of people in there that are from the drug and alcohol uh, programs that are, of course, around that area. And um, I would always encourage them to stay in AA because that was, that's the first thing they mentioned. Well, I, I, I like your description on, uh, on the drinking. I, I've been, you know, you know, drinking some wine with some friends. And when they drink, open all this expensive wine, drinking, enjoying it, <laughs> and I taste it, I say, hell, I, I, that doesn't, you know, do any good for no. me. I mean, I, I didn't enjoy it, you know, no matter open a few hundred dollar bottle, you know, oh, yeah. really different to me. Yeah. So I asked him, give me a glass of uh, uh, juice. Uh -huh. When I drink the juice with ice, it feels good. <laughs> so I know I will not be an alcoholic. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I have no questions. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned you spoke to the students at UCSD. I, I've seen the students at UCSD um, let's see, when I was in um, Mesa Vista, uh, we had one of the pharmacy students come over and uh, 
give all the druggies uh, talk about drugs. And after she was done, um, I approached her and I said, asked her, you know, does school um, teach you about addiction with, for pharmacists? And she told me no. Um, and and I've had seen other you know students because that's where I go for my but my it's, it's treatment. Not a, it's not a scheduled meeting. You you speak to the whole class, is it? Me? Yes. I I would. This is something that that my lawyer and I are trying to put together. So uh, my idea is to take a small group of them and be very personal about it. Um, and if you do, mm -hmm. how would you advise them to resist the temptation of taking that extra drugs or alcohol? You have to know your limit. You have to know wh when you're mentally... Uh, you, you come to your mental limit. Um, you know, you've lost people. People have died that are close to you. I lost my husband, my mother, my sister, who was a pharmacist, committed suicide, and my brother died in a motorcycle accident. And I had a stroke. Um, because of my migraine, uh, professor once warned me that I was a candidate for stroke. And on my 50th birthday, uh, I had a stroke. And I lost half of my vision, and it didn't come back for a couple days. Uh, I was in UCSD for that. Um, all of those things, things like that can push you over the edge. So know your limits. Don't work 80 hours a week. You, you don't need to do that. What, the company doesn't care. They're happy. You know, they're happy that, that you'll work your butt off for them. You, you know, know? I have to. They have a big student loan to pay off. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But 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 I think I just want to tell them what happened to me, and ha and where I got pushed, and what the limit was, and encourage them to know their limit, and to stop before they take that drug off off the shelf, to take that, that that's when they're in trouble. And then David Balfour um, does a lot of um, work for the board, so um, I, we're just assuming that he will give them current law. Uh, on addiction for professionals, I think is what David has in mind. Um, but he's still on for it. I, I sent him an email yesterday, and he said, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have no questions. Okay. Thanks for coming. The um, Suboxone that you're on, yeah. it's a partial opioid agonist, as yes. you're aware. Is it for alcohol, or is it for opioid? Opioids. Abuse. So it's for the opioid abuse. Yes. So it's to stop the cravings for opioid. Yes. Okay, so you're still, you're in treatment for that. Yeah, I, I don't, the problem is, I, I don't have, well, I'm on the Suboxone, so I don't have cravings. Mm -hmm. But that's not the problem. Is it to yes. Oh, to Suboxone. Yes, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and I need to get off of that. Um, and my, my doctor thinks it can take six weeks. Well, I'm, I'm working 60 hours a week just to pay for my food. Um, and I've tried. I, I, I've gotten down to a 16th of, of a strip twice a day, a 16th twice a day. And thought, okay, I could go. And no, I went right into... Yeah, it's horrible. I had a, a man, when I was working in the pharmacy at Shelter Island, when I was, you know, working for free, um, I had a man ask, ask me, how do I get off of this? And, and I just felt like, I, I said, well, you know, go look it up on, online and see what they say. I've tried that. Some of them say, you know, three, it's 72-hour half-life. It's a long half-life. So if you go three days and then make a change at the end of three days, go that way for another three days. Um, I've tried that. And I, and I hate it. I hate it. So essentially with that long of a half-life, mm -hmm. rather than a, like a cold withdrawal from the opioid, you're yes. prolonging it to six days oh. rather than three days. And so... Oh, yeah. And it's yeah. a partial agonist, so it still has opioid. Yeah, but... Partial. Yeah. So, so it kind of prolongs your misery. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So how long have you been on 
Yeah, have you been on the on that on the Suboxone? Yes. Uh, since two thousand three. Wow. Yeah. No further questions. So, so in a way, uh, you've been on probation since you lost your license. In two thousand three. What two thousand? Uh, and two thousand. Uh, yeah, two thousand three. You haven't. Yeah. And so. And yeah. Then, uh, now no, but I was drinking. I was drinking between two thousand three and two thousand eight. Uh huh. I was drinking. Um, and I was drinking heavy. And that's why in 2007, when I had to go into the hospital for a ruptured appendix, mm -hmm. I, I went into to convulsions because I was going on alcohol withdrawal. Sure. You know, I was drinking a bottle like this a day. And, um, and then, I, you know, I was in ICU for five days because I was having alcohol withdrawal. And um, it scared my daughter. Just really scared her. When I got when I got out of there, I I just said, "That's it, that's it, no more." And, and fortunately, that's when I found help too. And so you found help. Then you have your light got your license in 2013. Two thousand and thirteen. Eleven. Eleven, and then well, you, no, wait. I, you got your actual license in two thousand fourteen. Yes. Oh. Okay. Yes, because I, I I passed the NAPLEX, but I still had to pay pass the the uh, state. So, I thought it was good, though, um, to, to keep studying and wait on that uh, California board. Um, it gave me more time in sobriety. Um, and, and I only had two years when I came before the board in 2010. Uh, that was from 2008 to 2010. Then I had a year to study for the board, so I took my NAPLEX, passed it. So that's three years. And then an, a, another couple years... Um, to pass the the state, so I had what was that fourteen? Five. So that's five six years. Yeah, six years at that point. Yeah, most sobriety, and and I and I felt good about that. Mm -hmm. Two years, no. Mm -mm. Can I can I ask? Sure. Um, I like, like I always said, you know, you learned your lesson. You had your experience. You went you went through hell, and you know. You still survive, mm -hmm. and um, we'd like you know you to pass on you know uh, educate the future student or, or, or be a be a sponsor and you know take it, you know help the other others. Yeah, and um, you know you, because you got a lot of experience, okay? mm -hmm. you got a lot of experience, and um, you have to figure a way how to educate them, how to get the message across. Yes, and. With your experience, I don't know if you, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, hot, it's easy to talk about things. Mm -hmm. To me, my experience in mm -hmm. my pharmacy mm -hmm. is a picture speak a thousand words. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to, I mean, you, get, you, you say, well, if you go to, you drug abuse, you alcohol abuse, right. it has a consequence. Yes. But they don't see it. Yeah. They don't see it. So you have to, you have to figure a way how to get the message across. Yeah, I, okay. I know, I know. I mean, I, I hope you can find a way, because I don't know what way I mean. I find a way how to teach my patient how to take their blood pressure medicine. Right. And I give, I share the experience with you. Yeah. And it worked like a charm. Yeah. Okay? They're very okay. uneducated people. Yeah. They learn to take the blood pressure medicine. Yeah. Because, uh, so a lot of time, you know, when I consult them, I say, I always always say, I say, take your blood pressure medicine, take your blood pressure medicine. Mm -hmm. And they, and I ask them why. You know, what, you know. I say, why are you taking this high blood pressure medicine? They say, well, I have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. I say, do you know what it means? Yeah. You know, all they know is high blood pressure, but they don't know what it means. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and they cannot explain to me, you know, why? Because they don't know. It's what, all they know high blood pressure, but they don't know the consequence or the importance of it. Right. 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 So you know what I do? Yeah. I say. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they get that. They got that message. Yeah. In the neighborhood, they see a lot of people like that. Oh, okay. I'm not talking about population. I'm talking about the black community. Yeah. Okay? It's hard. A lot of them. Yes, that's, that's, that's hard. Like that. Yeah. Then, like I said, a picture speaks a thousand words. Mm -hmm. something, something they can relate to. Well, I can, I can relate. They can relate to, and it's something they see them. 
relative, their friend and relative, and in, in the neighborhood. Well, so, yeah. So each time they come back, you is know. There, yeah. Is there a question, Penny? I, I think we need to focus. Oh, on sorry. The, this yeah. Is more well, well, well. My my point is that you know, hopefully, she could figure a way how to educate the, you know uh, uh, ethic course or whatever in the future right. student. Well, figure you, a way how to get the message across so they could, they could understand. That, that, that's my well, point. They, I think they could understand that you'd lose more than a million dollars of income. Well, <laughs> right. hopefully that will. Well, anyway, I don't want to get on the subject. So okay. I just hopefully you. You, will, you will be able to go to different school and educate the other students uh, uh, with yeah, your experience. I I because, right. uh, because the board cannot do that. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, Mr. Mr. M, do you have any additional questions? I do not, Your Honor. All right. Um, and did you have any additional witnesses today, Ms. French? No, ma'am. All right. Thank you. At this time, then, I think the board has a good sense of, of the nature of your petition and your and okay. position. And the hearing in this matter will be concluded. The record is closed. The case is okay. submitted. We're going to go off the record in this matter at this time, and we'll proceed with the next petition. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. And Mr. Tao, it's finally your turn. <laughs> you guys want? <laughs> Are we on the record? All right, good afternoon. We're on the record in the final petition uh, before us today regarding uh, now Chow Tao. Am I pronouncing that correctly, sir? Tao. All right. And this is Office of Administrative Hearings, case 2017-030763. Today is March 30th, 2016. I have the appearance of the board members beginning uh, with Mr. Shot. The Bonds of Botman professional member. Amy Gutierrez, professional member. Debbie Beal, professional member. Victor Law, professional member. Stan Weiser, professional member. Albert Wong, professional member. And we have a quorum here today. Mr. Room, would you please state your appearance for the record? Thank you, Your Honor. Supervising Deputy Attorney General Joshua Room, appearing on behalf of the people, pursuant to Government Code 11522. Mr. Tao, you're here representing yourself here today. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, and you heard, you've heard that you've sat through the entire proceeding today. You've heard the explanation. You understand the nature of the proceeding. Yes. All right. So um, before we begin, I just wanted to uh, indicate that we do have a somewhat time limits. So I'm going to ask that uh, the participants focus their question on Mr. Tao's uh, rehabilitation efforts, um, so we can proceed through the proceeding. Today, um, Mr. Room, could you begin by uh, providing an overview of the case and address the exhibits? Certainly, Your Honor. I've placed four uh, documentary exhibits before Your Honor. The first of those is a one page, actually, it's two pages because they're two different copies, neither of which is good, but I thought that together the two of them might make up one good copy of uh, Mr. Tao's agreement to electronic recording of this hearing. Mr. Tao, uh, any any objection to Exhibit A? No. A is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Second exhibit is uh, Mr. Tao's petition for reinstatement and related documents, uh, including the petition itself, uh, three typewritten pages answering the questions, 
five pages of transcripts from the Kasumnis College, which is part of the Los Rios, Los Rios Community College District between 2009 and 2014, his enrollment there. Certificates for 30 and 31 and a half hours of board approved CE, all dated July 24th and 25th, 2016. And five letters of recommendation, two from pharmacists, one from a technician, and two from private citizens. Four of those five authors were contacted and verified. Ask that that be admitted, Your Honor. Right, and I note that, um, again, the, I will redact the birth date and the personal address on the first page of the petition. Any objection to the admission of the petition no. package? That will be admitted as Exhibit B. Thank you, Your Honor. Third exhibit is the original accusation filed against uh, Mr. Tao's license in January, on January 4, 2011, accusation number 3786, which alleged a, alleged a cause for discipline arising out of petitioner's January 2010 conviction of driving with a blood alcohol of 0.08% or more, with a special allegation of having a blood alcohol of 0.15% or more, based on petitioner's arrest on October 5, 2009, and his blood test showing a blood alcohol level of 0.19%. Um, on April 13, 2011, respondent who was not represented by counsel signed a stipulated settlement and disciplinary order agreeing to revocation stayed four years probation on terms and conditions including abstention, drug testing, recovery group, community service, a worksite monitor, and reimbursement of $1,190 in board costs. The decision and order of the board made that effective July 27, 2011. I ask that that be marked and let it admitted, Your Honor. Any objection to this ex uh, marked as Exhibit C and if so admitted? No. And then the final documentary exhibit, Your Honor, is a default decision and a petition to revoke. Uh, petition to revoke number 4412 was filed against petitioner on January 17, 2013, alleging three causes to revoke his probation arising out of his multiple violations of the drug screening term, both by failing to test and by positive tests, his violations of the abstention term through those positive tests, and his failure to complete, complete community service. Respondent did not respond or return a notice of defense to the petition to revoke, um, and the there was a default decision and order uh, entered, made effective June twenty third, June twentieth, two thousand thirteen, licensing, uh, revoking his technician license on that date. Ask that be marked and admitted. Any objection to Exhibit D? No, sir. D will be admitted. Mr. Tao is now twenty nine years old and was issued his te California technician license number seven eight two nine zero on October fourth, two thousand seven. He does not report licensure in any other state. The default decision and order after he failed to respond to the uh, petition to revoke for non-compliance with probation uh, revoked his technician license effective June 20th, 2013. Business and Professions Code Section 4309A1 requires a minimum three-year lapse before considering a petition for reinstatement. So he became eligible to petition as of June 20th, 2016. The petition is properly before the board. It's supported by recommend recommendations from the requisite number of board licensees, three where two are required, and private citizens, two. He has submitted proof of 31 and a half hours of CE, which is not technically re required for technician license for renewal, and so is not strictly a criterion for reinstatement, but is helpful to the board. Um, there are still the outstanding question of the original $1,190 in board costs that were ordered in the original uh, Payment original case, six, a balance of $695 remains on that original debt. Um, staff have assigned case number 6051 to this petition, so we'd ask that you use that case number on the decision as it's rendered. 6051. Yes, and that's, uh, I submit subject to cross examination, Your Honor. So, uh, Mr. Shaw, did you bring any additional exhibits today? No, I didn't. All right, thank you. And um, this is your opportunity to address the board, so I'll ask you first to please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give in this proceeding will be the truth and the whole truth? Yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, again, you're, you'll be allowed to speak in a narrative fashion if you want to address uh, key points regarding why you believe your petition should be granted. Speaking yes, of um, if it's okay, I'd like to uh, read my answers from 16 and 17 to why my uh, license should be reinstated. Um, I understand that my pharmacy tech license was revoked because of my DUI and also due to the fact that I violated my terms and condition on my probation during that time. That's why it was revoked. But I feel that my pharmacy technician license should be restored because the revoke of my license has been the largest setback in my life. During the time the disciplinary action were taken against my tech license, I was immature, 
my, you know, all young 20-year-old, 22-year-old, uh, very selfish and irresponsible. And I take full responsibility for my action. During the time my license was revoked, I was devastated. Before my license was revoked, it was suspended because, again, I violated my probation terms. Um, I was unemployed for a year and a half, and I struggled to pay for bills, cars, rent, um, student loans. Um, what was most important was that I didn't really realize it, realize what I have until it was like gone. And it wasn't taken. It wasn't taken away from me. I lost it pretty much because of my uh, immature decision or the way I thought back then. Um, during the time I was unemployed, I was still taking courses for the radiography program because even though I was not a pharmacy technician no more, I hope that one day I will be a pharmacy tech again and also further my education in the medical field. In August 2013, I was finally, finally employed by Sprouts Farmers Market as a produce clerk with no experience in produce. From August 2013 to present, my strong work at their positive attitude and great leadership has promoted me to primary produce clerk to a produce manager at Sprouts Farmers Market. Sprouts Farmers Market. Over the past few years, I've grown and matured dramatically and have taken life more serious. I believe in believe and am confident that with the reinstatement of my license, I can finally move on, move past the immature decision I have made in the past, and move in my life to tackle the curriculum of a pharmacy technician once again. Thank you. Um, any questions, Mr. Yes, Your Honor. Um, so uh, let's go back to your DUI conviction in 2010. Um, you had substantial blood alcohol level at that time. Um, what was your relationship to alcohol at that time of your life? Um, during that time, I was young. You know, I was at that party stage where, you know, it's like, okay, I'm in this party group, so it's all about partying, not thinking about anything else, but okay, you know what, let's do this, let's do that. Until, you know, I was arrested for my DUI, that opened up my eye, but I didn't think about, okay, you know, this DUI was going to take effect with my pharmacy license until I got the letter from the Board of Pharmacy um, mentioning about my DUI. So during that time, you know, I was still immature too. It's like, yeah, nothing's going to happen. Everything is fine. It'll go through until it was finally revoked. And then that's when, you know, I, I really realized that. I, I just lost something that I worked hard for and uh, I went to school for. Do you consider yourself an alcoholic or a problem drug, problem alcohol user? No, I do not. So when you were placed on probation, you knew you were restricted from drinking alcohol. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Correct. So when you continued to drink alcohol and came up positive for it, was that a result of just not taking the requirement seriously or did you think that you, or did were you unable to stop drinking? Um, I just didn't take that, um, you know, that seriously. Like, yeah, it's no big deal. So, you know, I did my poor judgment of still partying here and there, um, not considering what's going to happen in the future with my license. So at the time you entered into that probation agreement, um, did you intend to comply with those terms and conditions? I did, and once again, it's my poor judgment, um, not thinking um, correctly, not taking it seriously, like, you know, I'll be fine, I'll be fine, but. So if the board were to, say, reinstate you, and assuming they might do so on a, another term of probation, what confidence can the board have that you would take the requirements seriously this time and not uh, come back before the board on another petition to revoke probation? Um, one is because I'm not proud that it happened, but I'm glad that it happened to me at a young age. So from that time it happened until now, it's, you know, it's either you're going to learn from it or you don't. That's just how I see it. It's like a mistake it happens only one time. It doesn't happen again. If, you know, if it happened more than one, then it's not a mistake the way I see it. Okay, well, some people would say that 
you ought to have learned something from the mistake of your conviction. And so that at that point, hopefully, you would have wised up. But you, after your conviction, entered into the term of probation and yet still didn't take it seriously. So what, why would we believe that you're going to take it seriously this time? One is um, of where I'm at right now, um, what I lost back then, of what I almost lost. Um, and just, you know, um, just not giving up that, okay, um, you know, even though at this current moment I'm not a pharmacy tech no more, I'm still going to pursue my education in the medical field, which will be the radiography program, which I missed the deadline for this year, so I have to wait another whole year again. Um, but I was once a model back then, but this time it's like a better model to show, you know, like the young going like, this is what you could do and be good and don't do this and still be good. Or you could follow my footstep and either learn from it or don't learn from it. Have you, um, are you still a, a social or other user of alcohol? Um, you know, if I say no, you know, I'm going to lie, but I'm more responsible now. Um, the things I do, um, anything I do, it's more like, okay, I think more of the consequences now, you know, versus back then to where, okay, you know what, let's just do it. It sounds fun, let's just do it, but now it's like, uh, no, let's think twice about it before, you know, I actually do do it. As a consequence of your uh, conviction in 2010, were you required to attend any uh, drinking driver program or counseling for, by court order? Um, as part of your probation? Yes, I did. And what do you think uh, you learned from that program in terms of your own drinking and its relationship to driving? Um, it's actually pretty pretty tough for me to answer that too. Just, you know, also seeing like other people who, like on TV who drink and drive and black out and crash, it's like, that could have been me that could have done that, but luckily it's not. So I'm actually grateful that, you know, it's not me. Mm -hmm. So it seems like uh, since you were forced out of the pharmacy field, you've, you found a fair amount of success working at Sprouts Market. I'm curious why you'd want to leave that practice that 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 uh, profession to return to the pharmacy field where you might not even make as much money can you repeat that? I'm sorry well if you're having you seem like you've had some success at Sprouts you've been there for what three or four years now yes I'll, so. um, why would you want to leave there um, that seems like you've made a place for yourself there why would you want to go back to pharmacy um, pharmacy has always been my thing um, not just also my thing it's the title I want to carry even though I carry the produce manager there, it's not something that I want to see myself in the future as. It's more like tours at like the medical field, like mm -hmm. as a pharmacy tech versus like a produce manager. Okay. So you haven't worked as a technician since 2012, right? Correct. Do you think you're ready right now to go out and practice as a technician in California? Yes. What, I, do you, what have you done to get ready? What, what, what makes you think you're you're up on everything in terms of what you need to know to be a pharmacy tech. Here and there, I'll, you know, if I'm not too lazy, I mean, I am kind of lazy nowadays, but if I'm not too lazy, I'll read up upon any updates on pharmacy law when I get the chance. Um, I do have, like, the study guide for uh, the PTCB, if I have to take it again, to study, to refresh my memory. I still have all of my... Um, school stuff that I've done, that I kept. Well, just as an example, uh, have you, are you aware of the patient-centered patient safety labeling requirements? Do you know what I mean when I talk about those? No. Okay. Um, are you uh, aware of um, a new for board's new focus on compounding regulations? Do you understand the difference that's taken place in the last few years over sterile compounding? Um, I haven't read on uh, any of those. It's only like once in a while that I'll just click on a certain okay. article just to okay. read upon. Um, do you have any idea what kind of pharmacy 
an environment you'd like to work in? Um, I started out in the hospital at Kaiser and Patient Pharmacy, and you know, if it's possible, I do plan to go back in that, you know, in that inpatient um, field. If the board were to requ require a term of probation, would you be willing to comply with that? Uh, yes. And what if it were the same, exact same length of time in terms of probation as were previously ordered, including drug testing? Would you do if that? If it's the same as that, you know, this time it's, I'd be more mature to take care of the responsibility versus back then. Okay, I have nothing further at this point. Okay. Any questions from the board? So do you have a job? I mean, if, if you were, were going back to Kaiser, they will take you back or...? Um, to take me back, I don't know about take me back, but over at my current job right now, I see, you know, some of my former um, technician that do shop over at Strauss Fern Market, they'll ask me, you know, how my case is going. They'll tell me about, you know, how the pharmacy is doing, what's available, what's not available. So to take me back, I, I'm not sure. I think that's more like uh, Kaiser's decision on it. I'm not sure. So you, yeah. you have confidence you will find a non-technician job somewhere, right? Yes. Okay, no further questions. No questions, Your Honor. No questions. No questions. No questions. <clears throat> have you ever taken Uber, Lyft? Um, <laughs> one of my um, co-worker right now is actually an Uber driver, too. So, um, yeah, I'm just saying it because but I, mean, I have taken it one time just for the fun of it. Well, <laughs> if you ever find yourself in that position, um, you can save someone else's life in your, yours as well. But, um, you're pretty intoxicated those, those two times, yeah. Um, and uh, it, it uh, some to to uh, to remember, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully, uh, you make some wise choices in the, in the future. Um, I don't see the, the pattern since the last one, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you've apparently been doing good at work and um, being a manager and all. Um, uh, let's say that uh, you continue in uh, uh, understanding how you got yourself in that first position. Thank you. But have the best of luck. Thank you. No questions. And I'm assuming you don't have any additional witnesses. Uh, I do not. And do you have any uh, additional um, comments that you'd like to address to the board at this time? Uh, I do not. Nothing statements. further on it. All right. Thank you then, uh, Mr. Chow. The matter is submitted. Uh, the board will issue your decision. You'll receive that mail in the future. Right. We're off the record in this matter, and uh, we will now go into closed session. Thank, thank you. you.